Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 15th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. These calls are held every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Today's a special COVID calls, which is gonna run from four to 6 p.m. Most days you find us here at 5 p.m. These are free and open to the public and you're welcome to join us. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and I'm serving as the host for these discussions. We're streaming on YouTube Live. The link to this discussion can be found at the Scott Knowles YouTube channel, or you can email me, or you can find me on Twitter at US of Disaster. Please do help spread the word, send suggestions for guests and topics, and do please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. You can also hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts. Just go to soundcloud.com and search for the Slow Disaster Podcast. On Monday on COVID calls, we have a young researchers roundtable. I'm gonna to talk to five early career disaster researchers from many different disciplines. We're gonna talk about the way that the pandemic is impacting their thinking and their work. Maybe in some cases, even changing the trajectory of their work as they go forward. I'm going to be joined by Nania Campbell, Ryan Hagen, Yansil Kang, Zachary Loeb, and Valerie Marlowe. So you won't want to miss that discussion on Monday, 5 p.m. As of today, there are globally 1,076,017 confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Research, Resource Center. That's up from 998,047 cases yesterday. 261,438 of those are in the United States, up from 234,462 yesterday. There are now a total of 6,699 deaths reported in the United States, up from 5,648 yesterday. And a new number, which I first reported yesterday, again from the Coronavirus Resource Center, there are now reported 9,428 survivors of COVID-19 in the United States. Back in February, uh, about 10 years ago, I had the chance to do something I do every four years and that was to visit New Hampshire on the eve of the primary. This year was really special for me because I took my family. We crowded into tiny meeting halls and school gyms, elbow to elbow with crowds. We shook hands with Amy Klobuchar and Andrew Yang and Pete Buttigieg. We even met Judy Woodruff from PBS, which was really thrilling. And now that seems like a lifetime ago. Those crowds, that closeness, that excitement over the political process. But it is still election season. And though we and the candidates and the media are all engaging from behind our doors and our screens, I wanted to talk to a political historian and an analyst about the election 2020, which will certainly be remembered as one of the strangest circumstances for an election in American history. And I was thrilled when today's guest agreed. So let me introduce him. My guest is Julian Zelizer, the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs, the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University. He's the author and editor of 19 books on American political history, including just to list a couple, Governing America, The Revival of Political History, and The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for the Great Society. Most recently, he co-authored with Kevin Cruz the book Fault Lines, a history of the United States since 1974. He's published over 900 op-eds, including his weekly column, which I'm sure many of you follow on CNN.com. Julian Zelizer, thank you so much for joining the discussion today on COVID calls. Thanks for having me with you. So I'd like to remind everyone to please ask questions in the YouTube live chat, or you can email them to me, or you can tweet them however you want to try to reach me uh, to get involved in this discussion today with Julian Zelizer. So uh, Julian, I guess I'll just ask, um, we'll start, we'll get to history, but start with the present. I wonder if you would give us your assessment of the Trump administration's response to COVID-19. Um, weak areas, any strengths? What's your assessment? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say there's been many weak areas. Uh, this has been a halting and delayed response uh, given the situation uh, that we're in right now. It's hard to look at what the administration has done and find a lot of room for praise. Uh, it, it took too long to respond uh, in general. He himself uh, denied the situation well into uh, the crisis moment. And he didn't really use the presidential muscle that he has. Ironically enough, given he's willing to flex it in other areas, 
to lean on governors to do what was necessary to invoke the Defense Production Act to start having industry comply. Uh, and even through this day, he continues, uh, as we're recording this, it's a day after he a letter was released uh, to Senator Schumer, kind of engaging in what we might call traditional Trumpian rhetoric uh, mm -hmm. toward his opponents. And, and all of this doesn't add up uh, to a very successful response. This is, you know, Herbert Hoover in the early 1930s dealing with the Depression, uh, maybe worse. And I don't have the, the only places you could say, well, there's signs of, of progress is now uh, he's starting to do some of the things that he should have done about a month ago. Uh, you know, finally, he is acknowledging the severity of this disease uh, and the cost it might bear. Finally, he's calling for the kinds of measures, at least to some extent, that his own experts have been saying are necessary. Uh, and finally, he's acknowledging the science, uh, which he hadn't done, of what's going on. Well, I agree with your assessment. And yet at the same time, I've been surprised to see, I mean, often I have to check my own uh, interpretations of Trump's uh, actions against public opinion polling. And the polling, to me, has left me scratching my head a little bit. On the one hand, the numbers have, have ticked up, but they don't seem to have ticked up maybe as much as you might consider in the midst of a national crisis. I don't know, what have you thought about the, the polling around this? I haven't looked at it today, but he's been, he picked up three or four points over where he was before this all started. I haven't seen it today, although I saw a headline that it's already going down, the, the oh. boom is going down. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and, and I also saw that it's gone up for a lot of, of leaders in these countries, more than his own ratings. And and even other figures in the U.S. have experienced a bigger boom than him. So it's not, uh, it's not simply him. Uh, look, part of it is the same story we would have been talking about two months ago. He retains pretty loyal support in the Republican Party that's uh, kind of unyielding. And we're seeing, even with a stress test like this, at least initially, it can hold its own. Then maybe there is an additional bounce from the one you're, the, the poll you're talking about uh, when there's a crisis, people are scared. They're looking to someone, and he is the someone. The president is always the someone. But but I don't imagine that is going to hold uh, so long. Uh, this is not even like rallying around the flag in a time of war, which is usually when you see the boom, because this is here. It's on the home front. It's, it's more like the Civil War, uh, meaning we are feeling it. We are experiencing it. And unless he delivers progress very quickly, uh, the support that he's gained, I, I would assume, will thin very quickly. So do you then extrapolate from that that you don't really expect much of a difference in terms of the election? Um, you know, these numbers, if they're just a little bit increased and now they're going back to the mean, um, then people who support Trump support Trump and people who don't, don't. And, and that's that. We don't actually imagine this pandemic moving the needle for him much in terms of getting ready for the election. Well, I think it could move, if, if the Democrats handled this well, I could imagine it moving the needle for them in a positive way. Uh, meaning when you have a president in this kind of situation, it, it tends to go very poorly for them when they run for reelection, whether it's Hoover in 32, Carter in 1980, or, or pick your example of a president in crisis. Uh, and none of them, I, I would say maybe even Hoover was facing what we're facing right now. Um, and, and in terms of the, un we don't even know when this is going to end. So, so theoretically, Democrats should capitalize and they have a candidate now who has uh, lots of experience dealing with major uh, situations, including uh, these kinds of, um, of pandemics. Uh, but I don't know that the only way it might affect him in a positive way is not rallying around the flag. It's the inability of Democrats in the next few months to mount a campaign, meaning not being able to mount a traditional television campaign, not being able to get any attention, and literally not being able to go and hold rallies and have a regular mm -hmm. convention, all of that can be wiped away. And, and that's where the incumbent has an advantage, even if he's doing poorly, um, because he has the platform from now until November, that's guaranteed. So you mentioned the Democrats. I wonder if you'd be willing to, just like your assessment of Trump, how do you assess the way um, Bernie Sanders is still in, in the race and, and, uh, and as well as you know, Biden's campaign and the DNC more generally? 
How are they doing with messaging? As far as you can tell, how's the Biden campaign doing with all this? It's an extremely crowded conversation right now. I've barely seen him at all. I, I'm not surprised by that, but I just wonder what, what do you think of how the campaigns and how the DMC are working? Well, I think I see a lot of problems. Uh, I, I mean, it's not as if his support is imploding. So if you're a Democrat, you can be uh, happy with, with that. And I think it remains strong. I think the responses of Democrats have generally been in line with what the scientific community is calling for. So if, if you're a, uh, a, a voter who's not a total uh, kind of Trump based voter, I think what Democrats are doing aligns with what you hear has to be done. Uh, that said, that's different than kind of the political messaging and the political outreach. Their candidate has, has been silent. Uh, I know he has an, uh, a podcast and I know he's done some interviews and clips, but he's not a major presence in our national conversation right now. And that might be all right for a while, uh, but this is valuable time in campaigns. I mean, the primary season, even if you're competing with someone, is a way to get your message and prep the voters and get them thinking into the summer. Uh, that's gone. I think Democrats have a natural advantage. This is a crisis. It's resulting in big government and it's resulting as most crises do uh, in support for strong federal intervention. That's a natural democratic issue. And I've been surprised that you haven't really heard at the national level kind of Democrats making that case and, and being at the forefront of what's going on. Uh, in fact, Trump was the one who I think yesterday or two days ago called for a kind of public works program. And finally, look, the, the Biden-Sanders competition uh, as an ongoing issue, it's hard to believe uh, right now, especially since uh, he secured such a good lead. But the inability of the party to control that in the middle of this crisis suggests there's a problem. So, so I don't think they've imploded. I don't think it's all doom and gloom. But I think there have been some serious red flags. Uh, and this will not end again. It's, it's going to continue probably through the election maybe in different parts of the country. And we don't know how it's gonna unfold, but it won't disappear. So they need to figure out how do you campaign? One other thing, I mean, another kind of issue that's looming and a few people are addressing in op-eds like myself, but uh, is the election itself and how it's gonna mm -hmm. work. And uh, if there's low turnout, if there's very low turnout, it, that w might very well benefit President Trump. And, mm -hmm. and to avoid that with these conditions, that will require action by the states uh, and maybe even money from Congress so that states have universal mail-in voting, early voting in place in places they don't have it. All of this needs to be done very soon. Uh, but I could imagine Democrats are hurt if that doesn't happen because you'll see, you could see, you know, very low rates of turnout in November mm -hmm. uh, if it's possible at all. I wanted to ask you about that because I know there was some debate around in that stimulus package debate about federal, so as I understood it, federal money uh, to support states in mail-in voting. How many, uh, most states don't have mail-in voting. In most states, it's, are not really set up for a kind of a distant election, are they? Can they move quickly enough to actually bring that about? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, what I've heard from election people is it is possible, it won't be easy. But we're, we are still uh, in, in, we're in April now, I'm looking at my calendar, and you lose track of time uh, in this situation because you're in the same place all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, we're several months into it. If we could pass a multi-trillion dollar stimulus bill, I can imagine you can get a lot of the infrastructure for mail-in voting uh, in place. It's hard, you are right. Some states it will require circumventing uh, traditional legislative paths. I think in New York even, uh, you need a constitutional convention to get a whole thing in place. You need some declaration of emergency. Mm -hmm. You need processing capacity. All this comes in, not only is it delivered, but you need to process it quickly uh, and, and relatively smoothly. You need uh, measures to make sure votes are counted well. There's, there's a lot that has to be done. But I don't know, given the severity of what we're doing, if we can do it for the economy, we can certainly do it for the election. So uh, there's a perennial, it comes from the left and sometimes from the, from the right, there's a perennial conspiracy theory, which I don't want to give any, any credence to, but that any given president is looking for a, a reason to cancel their reelection, to, to have a, use a crisis and then cancel election day. 
I don't see that. But is there any precedent for thinking or any any rules out there that could trip um, some process to actually move election day? Or is there a, a threshold of voting turnout below which that raises constitutional issues or we're charging ahead for November and that's that? I mean, I am not a constitutional expert from, but what I hear and read from all of them is no, you can't just do that. There's no way for the president to cancel the election. We haven't been in a situation uh, where this was really on the table uh, during the flu uh, in 1918, the Spanish flu, as it was called, voting for midterms went and we did it. And that was a very severe crisis, as you obviously know. Uh, during wartime, during depression, we have had our elections over and over again, even when the system is strained. So uh, there, there is no turnout kind of requirement. There is no way for the president to constitutionally just say it's not going to happen. Not that he won't try. I could imagine him looking for some declaration of emergency power uh, to, to maybe do this, but, but, but no one is supporting the idea that this, this can be done. Uh, and, and so the odds are, even if it's a very low turnout election, it will still be an election nonetheless. Under kind of the traditions of American politics, um, of course, we have campaigns in the middle of wars, 1864 and you know, 1944 and the middle of the Vietnam War, as you mentioned, Carter a minute ago. That's nothing new. Um, I do think a sort of a deference to the executive uh, as a person that you give um, some leeway to in, in that context is has been historically in America important. You know, the opponent wouldn't come out every single day and, and criticize the way they're handling, handling something. Um, and it seems like that's how Joe Biden is acting. You were talking about Biden and, and his podcast maybe, but his sort of missing voice in this. Is he playing by old rules that shouldn't hold anymore? I mean, Trump isn't playing by those old Old, old rules. Why is Biden playing by those rules? Where is Joe Biden? Well, Biden is an old rules kind of candidate. And until now, you know, the, the bet of his, of his campaign, which, is, which worked, at least until recently, was there was something appealing in this moment, uh, given that President Trump has stretched the rules or, or just totally shattered them beyond recognition, some almost nostalgic kind of campaign for someone who would still do things the old way, uh, who would still believe that normalcy is possible uh, in this country. And, and to some extent it worked, his polls held, he was able to pull off uh, the, the kind of primary victories that he promised, at least in the first one. So we don't even know how the rest are going to go. Uh, but I think you're actually right. I mean, um, when, when a president is failing this poorly to handle something that has this profound effect on all the families, there's no reason for the Democratic candidate not to be out front, both criticizing him aggressively and saying what he would do differently. Um, that doesn't undermine the president. Nothing Biden is going to do would make this uh, kind of more problematic, but it does kind of give uh, other voters a, a path for the future. And I do think if he just plays by the old rules, as he has now been shrunk uh, to a little box, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on, on computer screens, that's going to be really problematic. Mm -hmm. And I would say one other thing, I've thought about this, it, often when you have pres uh, uh, opposition people play by these rules, it, it's bad for the country. Uh, Often early in wars like Iraq uh, in 2002 and 2003, Democrats, the lesson was they sh shouldn't have signed on so quickly. They mm -hmm. were scared to protest. They were scared to take on President George W. Bush. Had there been more criticism, we might not have ended up in that quagmire. And, and I can give many examples. So not only is he playing by old rules that might not work, it's not necessarily the best thing for the country, which is always at the forefront of Biden's concern. You, you have some historical examples that you're thinking about when you say that, where you think had a more uh, vigorous debate in election season actually either shifted the incumbents policies slightly or somehow resulted in a different outcome for the country? Sure, in 64, Democrats, it was intra-party, were silent generally about what uh, Lyndon Johnson was doing in Vietnam when he asked for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution in August of 64, they don't want to do anything to upset, you know, uh, his own reelection chances. And, and it's disastrous. It's, it's a disastrous mm -hmm. moment. Had more Democrats 
who privately had misgivings about why we were doing anything in the region and what the goal was been more vocal, uh, we might have been in a better place. So that's uh, just one example uh, and a big one that we should think about. Well, also, like you said, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I tend to agree with what you said. November is coming and the election is coming. There's certain traditions and norms around that, but there's a lot, um, a little bit more flexibility around the way parties can operate, right? I mean, yeah. we still have to get through these primaries and caucuses and territories and states. We still have to have a conventions, I suppose, or do we have to have conventions? Let's talk about that a little bit. I, I don't, I mean, we don't have to. Uh, you know, uh, this year, the Republicans canceled their primaries in, in a lot of states, which was upsetting to some Republicans who don't like President Trump, where the administration essentially worked with the Republican Party to take other options off the table. Mm. Conventions have been done in different ways. They've been reformed. They can be moved around. They don't have to happen. I mean, I guess you could have a virtual nomination take place. I don't know if it physically has to happen. Uh, we haven't been in this kind of territory. I think the Democrats certainly are going to have to reimagine and, and possibly the Republicans how you do this. How do you campaign using the technological resources that we now have available that we're speaking on uh, to, to, to campaign in a different way? But right now, between April and June, uh, which is traditionally still, you know, high time for primaries and caucuses, they're just not going to happen. Wisconsin's doing theirs, which is very questionable decision, uh, given everything that's going on. Absolutely, yeah. And the Democrats move their convention to August, although it's unclear if they're going to be able to have that, and it's in an area that might be more affected in the summer than it is right now, given how it's kind of a rolling uh, contamination mm -hmm. that's taking place. So, so they they can they they have a lot of room to be flexible. I mean, and and it's incumbent on the party leaders right now to respond to the crisis on their part by saying, let's do the campaign in ways that are safe. I want to remind everyone that we are speaking with Julianne Zelizer of Princeton University about the pandemic and politics. And please get your questions in using the chat function on YouTube Live, or you can tag me on Twitter at US of Disaster, or you can email me directly question to SGK. 23 at drexel.edu. Julian, I want to stay with this with the Democrats um, for a minute. And uh, there was some, uh, Cuomo has done, I think, an extraordinary job and really shown how federalism actually works in a crisis that governors can become as important, or I would argue in this moment, more important than the president. Um, and so there's been this discussion of, well, you know, uh, who's to say the superdelegates don't somehow get behind uh, Cuomo, and we have some sort of a revolution at the at the convention, maybe even a digital convention, and we don't end up with Joe Biden as the nominee. That seems a little far fetched to me, but at the same time, those conventions can be volatile. It, does the math work on that, or no? Joe Biden is the nominee. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I think I put on Twitter. A couple people have asked me that in the last few days. Uh, can there be some kind of switch? Can the super delegates? You know, can he be nominated and the delegates move uh, in a different direction? And, and I instantly always answer it's far fetched or that's not going to happen. And then I step back and say, why am I possibly saying that after what happened in 2016, <laughs> after what we're seeing now? I mean, who imagined this was all going to happen? And, and yet it's happening. These questions are front and center. I, I still don't think it's going to happen simply because I think. Uh, despite this kind of speculation, most Democratic delegates, including the super delegates, will be settled on Biden as a candidate. I think uh, they like him. I think they're worried about, can he do this? Uh, but I do think there's support. And I think that's only going to solidify uh, as, as this gets uh, worse. And, and Cuomo is not, you know, he is doing, I think he's doing a very good job. There's critics who say he's not doing as good a job as Governor Newsom in California or some others uh, who, who have stepped forward. He's also untested. I mean, he didn't run uh, and there was a reason for that. He also draws a lot of heat for parts of his record and compromises he's made and his style is not a style meant to earn a lot of friends. Um, and so none of that's all an unknown. So Democratic delegates are gonna th think about that. Uh, Biden's now a known commodity. So, so I think it will go to Biden, but it would be surprising if there's not some promise 
uh, that, uh, that Cuomo and some of these other governors are not gonna be officials high up uh, in this administration, because you're right. I mean, they are the face of the party when the rest of the party has been absent and they have a unique platform where they can not be political, uh, but really promote what the party is about. And I think for a lot of voters right now, Cuomo is the best advertisement for the Democratic Party. Uh, he is living and doing on a daily basis what a lot of voters would like that uh, is different than what they're seeing from the White House. Yeah, I've been thinking that, you know, just like Rudy Giuliani really became the face of the 2004 convention for Republicans, that maybe Cuomo is going to become the face of this, of this, uh, well, if they have a convention, whatever convention happens, Democrats are going to want to put him and Newsom um, right out front. And even listening to you talk, I'm sort of wondering, is, is Cuomo somehow is he our next health and human services secretary or the next DHS secretary? Is that kind of what you yes. what you have I mean, in mind here? I, I would have said that he's natural to be vice president at this point. I mean, uh, if that was open ah. for Biden, put him on the ticket. You have the highest profile Democrat right now uh, who who could uh, who could run. But Biden did promise that he was going to uh, nominate a female. Uh, uh, running mate. And so I, I just don't think, you know, he wants a Bush right. moment going back on his first big promise like this for a hugely important constituency. So yes, yeah, something on, uh, on, on intelligence security. I, I mean, I don't, any position at this yeah. point, these are the heroes of 220 uh, politically. I mean, the, the healthcare workers are the heroes on the ground and the delivery workers, uh, but politically they are the heroes right now. So why wouldn't uh, Biden said, I mean, I think he should, he, he could probably not name some of his cabinet right now and say mm. that, that would generate excitement. This is who I'm going to pick. This is who my team will be. This is what you get January 221 if you elect me. And he should be surrounded by a lot of these governors who are doing exactly the right thing. But I had thought up until a month ago, ACA, ACA, Abrams, or Char, Lower Char, were definite shoe-ins for the vice presidential, vice presidential pick. And now I'm not wondering if it isn't the governor of Michigan, Michigan, Michigan or Governor Whitmer, yeah. particularly yeah. after the the battle that she picked with President Trump. Yeah, he picked it first, and then she went after it. They both found something politically expeditious in that moment. They played it in their own in their own way. Um, I don't know. What do you What do you think? Has is that the kind of thing we should be looking at? These governors who have yeah, I mean the discussion. Into the, moment. the discussion of who who the candidates might be, the VP pick has changed in the last few weeks, and uh, she's one of them. And there's there's another uh, a number of governors who I've seen floated who I, I don't know enough about. I don't know their backgrounds, but clearly the Biden team is looking to that pool in Michigan. She's drawn a lot of real uh, kind of uh, uh, praise, and then a bunch of the governors have. So. Um, I don't know. Vice presidential picks, I never like to guess because usually it's no one who's on a list. Right. So you're always wrong. It's a setup. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I think you can't, as a Democrat in this crisis, ignore the gubernatorial pool, uh, mm -hmm. female male that has, has been uh, so outspoken, so visible. I mean, they also are visible. So given what mm -hmm. we're talking about, it's hard for Democrats. Even in the news right now, there's just not a lot of political coverage. Uh, it, it's, it's really been shrunk. I mean, if you turn any network on, most of the discussions are with doctors or with uh, you know, politicians on the front lines or healthcare workers, as it should be. But that means for politics, there's just not a lot of space. And so the governors have this space from now until it ends. Uh, and so I think Biden's gonna be looking seriously, not only for cabinet, uh, Kind of predictions or promises, but also for that VP pick. Now, uh, it's always um, for me very dangerous to try to do any kind of analysis of Trump's decision-making process. But I want to stick with the governors here for a second, um, because you know the Stafford Act and the way that um, our federal disaster structure works gives the president extraordinary powers in, in disaster to, to declare major disasters to funnel funds, I mean, even to use the Defense Production Act. Um, and some people have seemed a little bit surprised that Trump would play favorites in this moment. And, and I don't mean he's deciding this number of ventilators should go to this state and this should go to that state, but he does have discretion. And there's good evidence, good research to show that presidents in election years, particularly, 
are attentive to electoral politics when they make disaster declarations. Are you worried about that? Do you see him doing that? I mean, is there a way to analyze his strategy of, of who's on the in list with Trump and who's on the out list? Well, if you've been following his presidency, there's no reason you shouldn't be worried. Uh, mm. You know, the whole impeachment trial and, and hearings, it was all about this issue. Uh, here, is there a president who's willing to use his policy power for personal ends? That, that was the story. And, and those who voted to impeach him said, that's just not tolerable. And they always said, imagine this in another situation that was more immediate, not Ukraine, but what happens if there was a hurricane? That was the example always given. Yeah, and right. he said, well, you get it if you come out and say you support me in 220 kind of thing. And, and, and we've seen other examples. That's who he is. Uh, uh, he, he is uh, in, intensely political in that way. Uh, he sees very few boundaries about how uh, you can do this and what you're allowed to do. Uh, and right now, I, I can't imagine that there's, he ignores red, blue maps as he's thinking uh, of how this is all going to play out. And the comments that he has made about Schumer uh, just recently, and he's made the same about Cuomo, or then now he likes Cuomo because Cuomo has figured out if you praise the president, you yeah. get in his good favor. Um, this is how he thinks. And, and uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous stuff uh, because not only is it a bad way to do policy, uh, especially if you're doing this on steroids, but it actually won't work. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a myth in terms of being able to solve this in a few states and not others. It's, it's a disease that spreads uh, and people will travel. You'll never cure this thing. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of reason to be worried about that. The only hope is the constant hope with the Trump presidency it's the, the Dr. Fauci hope that there are people uh, who can push back. Uh, he's one of the strongest that we've seen in mm -hmm. terms of going against that basic um, tendency of President Trump. It's interesting the the people I've had a chance to speak with at FEMA, for example, it's exactly this thing. It's, you know, you, you turn on the TV and you see one thing, but then you talk to experts in the bureaucracy, the so-called deep state. And I always come away from those discussions feeling better because they have a, they know the law, they know the norms, they know the practices, they're working their tails off out there. But this whipsaw communications, even in the last few days, should we or should we not have masks, is trying for them, grinding for them. I mean, it was already bad in, in so many science agencies, but now it's across the entire bureaucracy. I mean, do you think we're at a moment where Trump's inadequacy, his unpredictability just finally breaks the bureaucracy and we have sort of open rebellion in the ranks where people say we just have to follow a sensible course not what not what trump is doing i sort of I, when i see anthony fauci at a press conference i sometimes think he's just about to say don't listen to this guy listen to me you know of course he doesn't because he's a professional but i don't know it, it, what do you think about the bureaucracy can it hold together under trump in this moment I think parts of the bureaucracy are doing that and they're, mm. they're doing better work and, and they're engaged in more open pushback than we've seen mm. in other times. Uh, you know, before when, when the president did this on diplomacy, the State Department kind of crumbled rather than rising up and stopping it. But this is a different kind of situation. I mean, everyone in the bureaucracy not only has the uh, feeling of obligation that you talked about and uh, the sense of mission that they feel the president is often jeopardizing. They are real people. So they're living in the world that is affected by this. They have family members who are living, they are in lockdown and they have the same fears of catching this and, and uh, it being lethal or, or tremendously debilitating. And so that's the kind of crisis that is going to trigger opposition uh, to, to the president. And I, I think you're gonna see more of that, especially the president isn't just a little at odds. He's really been at odds with what most of the nonpartisan experts are saying to do. And, and you can't have mixed messaging when you're in that bureaucracy slash state, you know, trying to get people to do the right thing within days so we can stop right. this. And the president's kind of just, you know, throwing water on all of this uh, with one bad statement. So, so I think that's part of why the bureaucracy acts so aggressively right now. Is Mike Pence's political career finished? I think everyone in the inner circle, I, I really do uh, think 
might very well be finished other than uh, jobs that are uh, kind of only relevant to the reddest of reddest areas. Um, this is a disaster, this is a calamity. I mean, it's hard when you're sitting in your home as we are and yeah. following it, writing about it, you're a citizen just trying to find food. What a calamity this is for the country that just happened. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's not simply that we are shut down. It's not, it, the numbers you read when we started this are, kind of staggering and we're not even near the end yet. This is a war taking place in terms of the death toll. Uh, and, and the economy, it's gonna just take a long time and not only to recover, but a lot of people will lose their jobs and livelihood in the process. Many Americans are losing experiences, uh, whether it's graduation, whether it's weddings and that matters politically. I mean, you feel it when that all just goes away and you can't bring it back. And so I think everyone associated with the administration that has failed to respond until now, unless they really change and somehow mobilize in heroic fashion, uh, I think they're gonna be politically tarnished for a long time. So what you were just saying, I thought it was really well said that this is a fundamental rupture in American, in the trajectory of American history and probably will be felt across many different policy domains. So just to bring it back again, to the Biden um, Sanders uh, race, insofar as there's still a race, um, San some of these ideas which were deemed even a month ago too out of step, yeah. like Medicare for all, um, are they on the table now? Can the Democratic Party move more aggressively towards, I mean, now it just seems like Obamacare feels like a conservative policy flag to be waving. Or is it possible that a Bernie Sanders plank in the platform comes in and we really do move in that direction for Democrats? It could be. I mean, it could be ultimately that's part of the compromise that's made. And it's not made just because Sanders had more staying power than Biden supporters thought, which would have been the original way this played out. So they put a plank and make promises that support the Sanders people. But now we're actually in a situation where some of Sanders' ideas or versions of them might be more appealing uh, to not only Democrats, but even some independents and Republicans. I mean, a few months ago when the word trillion was thrown around, mm -hmm. discussions of Medicare for all, and we were trillions, but just that one word or the Green New Deal, everyone said, that's crazy, nothing will ever, we're not gonna spend that much money on anything. It's unrealistic, as Biden would say, and yet we just, passed a stimulus within, I can't remember how many days it was, uh, that, that that's a, you know several of those uh, trillions. Right. And so we're in a new arena. And then this has kind of revealed major strains in our infrastructure, whether it is healthcare and, and what healthcare can provide or access to healthcare to public health is now gonna be a big issue in terms of spending on, on a really uh, robust infrastructure because uh, even when this is solved, and it will be, uh, or contained, we have to worry about the next one. And right. we have to worry about these happening more frequently. And you can't always shut down the country. So what you need is an infrastructure to track it, to test it, and then to treat it. And all of those are more Sanders-like uh, spending ideas and visions. So I think Democrats are going to include more of that. And I think some of uh, Biden's pragmatism might look very different in the summer in terms of what he's willing to accept. So I've restrained myself for 39 minutes, but now I really want to talk about history. Uh, so I want to ask you, I want to ask it in this way, based on your knowledge of American history and leadership. Uh, you get five minutes with President Trump this afternoon because he's looking for a historical example of a leader in crisis and maybe they got off on the wrong foot in the crisis and they need to regroup. Where are you gonna point him? What historical parallels, which presidents, or it doesn't even have to be presidents, but you know, American leaders where they were facing a disaster, maybe things didn't go the way they wanted at the beginning and then they righted themselves and they brought things around the way that, that helped the country. Do you have anything for him? Sure, it's the easy one. It's the standard one, FDR. I mean. FDR faced two crises of immense <clears throat> magnitude. The depression was like this in that it affected the entire body politic. It was severe and that was very long. 
uh, and FDR rallied in so many ways uh, from his ability to communicate and create calm and confidence in where this was all going to his willingness to use presidential authority and power mm -hmm. and work with Congress to just put the uh, kind of mechanisms of government to work, not necessarily even to solve the depression, but to create some base of normalcy with social safety net programs, public works programs and more. And he did the same thing in World War II. Uh, and, and, and the lesson for a, a Trump isn't simply FDR is this classic model of leadership and overall his programs really worked pretty well, even though initially there was lots of stumbling and, and some programs were really off and, and, and didn't do what was needed to be done. But he was immensely successful. He created a coalition that outlasted him. He's reelected many times. He's immensely popular. He's still regarded as one of the great presidents. And, and, and so you could imagine if President Trump thought a little differently about politics, right now he could be doing things that are good for the nation uh, and at the same time good for his reelection and legacy. Uh, he doesn't. And that's a big puzzle about him. Uh, He's still dealing with the map in some ways of 2018 rather than 2020. But FDR is, is a leader uh, from the fireside chats to the World War II mobilization, production mobilization of resources we needed. That's the model that we would need President Trump to look at right now. Mm. Do you see the presidency changing through and after this pandemic is over? I mean, we're looking at it's a term I use, a slow disaster. It's going to play out over time. It's going to, there could be various different events within it, not until we reach a vaccine and maybe after are we going to say we've reached some kind of resolution here. So do you think in that period of time, you're going to see fundamental changes to the, to the executive branch, to the presidency? Well, the presidency, I, I would assume you would. I mean, usually crises tend to expand the power of the presidency mm. and, and it doesn't go back to where it was. Um, that's how executive power has, has grown, as you know, throughout the 20th, 21st century. Uh, and, and you'd expect that, but I don't know. He's not invoking, he doesn't seem to want to use his power that much right now, uh, ironically, ironically enough. Uh, but my guess is the demands of this as it unfolds will require more presidential muscle. Uh, and, and you know, now he's using the Defense Production Act, for example, on certain industries. And so if I'm just looking at the history, we will come out of this with a, a stronger uh, a presidency, uh, a more robust presidency than, than when we started. Um, but at the same time, I think governors might kind of emerge, as you said, with federalism, uh, they might emerge as bigger players too. So uh, you might have an expansion of executive authority, not just in Washington, uh, but even even in the state houses as, result, as a result of this. Today, Governor Cuomo was uh, announcing how he's going to use the power he has to redirect resources in New York, moving things from one hospital to another. So that's another example where you see a governor doing that. Have you ever seen the country this polarized? Yes, I mean, it's been this polarized for a while. And Civil War notwithstanding, I, I, I'm thinking back to your example of Roosevelt and whether or not he he faced this level of polarization as he was enacting those those big sweeping sweeping reforms yeah we are we are in uh, this era is one of the most polarized in terms of uh party polarization so the 60s you had a lot of polarization it wasn't along the lines of party um by the late 1960s but but we are now in a period and, and this is what i spent a lot of my time writing about uh not simply people disagree but the forces of political polarization are deeply embedded in how our institutions work, from how the parties work to the media, uh, to much more. And that doesn't go away uh, in crises. It didn't go away after 9-11. And I think it's kind of shocking to people right now, it's not going away right now. Uh, and so you see the consequences when that's playing out as we need to actually be more unified in what to do that's the disastrous moment that isn't as clear uh, in normal times. You know, everyone laments party polarization is dangerous. It's bad if, if the uh, parties can't get along and, and do what's necessary, uh, or if different states work in different ways, or if people are listening to different media. 
and not getting the same information. It's one thing to say that in relatively normal times, but when we are daily wondering, when does the economy come back? When do our lives come back? When will we start to lower the number of people dying overnight? That polarization, it, it, it's clear how debilitating it can be. I was looking at one of the maps, I think it was in the New York Times where they were showing the regional differences um, in the response. This disaster is unlike any we've really ever had in that every state and every territorial emergency operations center and every municipality in America is responding simultaneously. I mean, only ever in the Cold War did we do serious planning for a, a disaster national in scope. The 1918 pandemic, as you point out, played out that way, but we had no federal apparatus to really, to really deal with that. And yet this times maps are showing um, the very different approaches that different governors have taken. And even they had one map that showed the amount of um, the distance people were traveling. Were they keeping a normal travel schedule, a half curtailed travel schedule um, or no travel at all? And that map to me was jarring at a number of levels, but one of the levels was that it basically, the entire old Confederacy was discernible as a part of the country that seemed to be taking a different approach to this disaster than those in the Northeast or, or in the West. I mean, there seemed to be deeper patterns there around trust in, in government, about localism, maybe about trust in science. I don't know totally how to interpret that and the social media has been alive with, you know, arguments about no, it's rural versus urban, or it's about religion versus irreligion. I don't know if you had a chance to look at those maps or what you make of it, but it seems like we've tapped into some sort of ur politics here in America right now in this moment that transcends Donald Trump. Well, I mean, it, look, it makes sense in that uh, in very partisan, uh, uh, in a very partisan era, if people are uh, a philosophically in different places. So these are regions where you just don't trust government. You're not gonna trust what they say. You're not gonna trust government to be helpful in a moment like this. Uh, if you don't trust expertise, you're not gonna listen to a scientist come and say, you need to be in your house for the next month or this isn't gonna end. You tend to dismiss it. Uh, then they're listening, getting their cues from different political leaders. So this mm -hmm. is a region by and large that uh, kind of uh, lives and dies by the Republican Party, they will have been listening to a party that until recently, a lot of officials were downplaying what was going on and engaging in some level. And this is a way to get President Trump rhetoric rather than this is a pandemic that's unfolding. And they'll hear those cues. Uh, they'll listen at some level. And then finally, we literally have different information flows now in the media. And so if this is a country, a part of the country where the news is coming from Fox, which until recently was downplaying this and saying it was a way to also go after President Trump, you put all that together, no one's gonna shut anything down in those regions of the country. They're not going to believe it. Uh, and that's the total ultimate effect of intense polarization in the middle of a crisis. The crisis itself, the disease itself is not strong enough to break that. I find that extraordinary, but it's maybe just my own uh, presentism sometimes and naivete to think there's a disaster that's big enough to reset that. But those old patterns, those beliefs, those localisms are in many ways um, reflected uh, also in this federalism of America, that okay. local officials have had a lot of power through this, right? And it was the same, I mean, with 9-11, which was not, it was very severe and very traumatic, different than this. But early on, I, I, I wrote about this in an earlier book, and I just, I remember looking at the, really the news and it was the same kind of predictions uh, from politicians, from reporters, from people interviewed that this was so severe. Now we were finally gonna come together. Members of both parties stood on the Capitol steps and did a kind of show of unity, but that broke down by October, one mm -hmm. month after they were arguing about airline security and the parties were in different places, and that would only get worse over the course of the next few years. So we, we overestimate how much these moments can break how our politics works. I mean, I suppose if there's an advantage to democracy, the way the United States has framed it, it's that speech and lots of it and angry speech persists throughout almost any moment in our history. 
and yet we still seem to have transfer of transfer of power. I mean, maybe we shouldn't let those partisan squabbles bother us so much. But what you were saying earlier is that and you mentioned science earlier. We still do need some established facts, right? That can cut across party boundaries. I mean, I, I would like to have robust disagreement about when we should relax the shelter in place orders, for example, but I would like to have those based on uh, Tony Fauci or other scientific experts saying, these are the facts we can present to you. I, mean, I think that's exactly right. I think I, I could make an argument that partisanship's good for the country and it's good to have parties with different views. It's good to have that debate. It's good that even in a crisis like this, and, and I mentioned this earlier, there's value to not having everyone agree uh, because politicians make big mistakes and uh, they don't get things right. And often you need the opposition to do things, but you need some kind of boundaries to how partisanship is going to work. You need some kind of agreement on common sets of facts and information before you begin the debate. You don't have that, then you're in a world of chaos. You also need in terms of how the parties are willing to combat each other, some rules. Uh, it's, it's like any sport. It, it's fine for the teams to be incredibly competitive. We enjoy watching that, but you do need rules. It, it's not anything goes because then it's not fun to watch. It's just pure chaos and mayhem. Mm -hmm. so unless it's worldwide wrestling or extreme boxing, right. uh, that's, that's not what you're looking for. And I do think we are now in an era where we have neither of those. We don't have an agreed set of facts and knowledge that's gone. And, and we have a kind of partisanship. And I tend to kind of put more of the weight on this on the Republicans and the Democrats, because there are more Joe Bidens uh, than in the Democratic Party. Um, meaning, uh, I think the Republicans since the 80s have really moved to a place where it's not simply they are partisan. This is the focus of my book that's coming out soon. Uh, but it's a what's, kind of- What's it called? What's the book called? Of burning down the house. Uh, Newt Gingrich, the fall of the speaker and the rise of the new Republican party. And, and that's part of the argument. It's not just they were, they were partisan. It's a kind of partisan where, where anything goes, any institution can be torn down and, and norms are irrelevant. So you combine those two, that's the toxicity that we have right now. Uh, and that's what makes it scary uh, because you don't know, you can't have confidence that at some point this is gonna work out in the world of politics. We don't know, that would be kind of ignoring where we, what we've seen in recent years. That chaos and the breaking of norms uh, really disturbs me too. And yet when I speak with my students and so I speak with young people, they're not focused on that. They're focused on, um, and I think you've written about this, they're focused on health sciences. They're focused on vaccine. They're focused on um, information and big data. Uh, I, I'm trying to have an optimistic moment here, I suppose, in which um, maybe sort of counterintuitively the younger generation, which we would think wants to break free of norms and rules, maybe they're the ones who are going to actually say, no, science and engineering and good data, social science, this is what we need so that we can have jobs in a country for crying out loud. Does that, do you, does that resonate with you, with your students or are mine just particularly I think, I mean, hopeful? I, <laughs> right now I'm seeing my students on a computer but I know I wrote an op-ed in CNN about that. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to find good things that can come out of this. Uh, that's part of what I want to do. And I, I do believe there's something to that. There are these moments, horrendous moments in American life uh, that, that shift what young people think is valuable to do once it's over. So after the Great Depression, you know, working for government, public service becomes something that lots of people go into in the 1940s and 50s. That's one of the growth areas of jobs. It's seen as a, as a virtuous thing to do, uh, as opposed to something that's not worthwhile. After Watergate, obviously, which is another horrendous movement, you have a boon of people wanting to go into journalism and they see this as a great vocation. And I do feel like you're gonna see uh, a renewed interest in, in sciences and medicine broadly defined, uh, because this is, has really made clear uh, how these institutions need to be strengthened and built. And, and these are the heroes. I mean, most people, while they might follow the politics, they know what the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers, they know what they're doing. They're risking their lives right now. So I think it would be a positive outcome if after you know a decade plus of science getting bashed, this becomes an era when this is over 
where younger people in their 20s uh, who are now home from college say, you know what, mm -hmm. this is part of what I want to do with my life and I want to make sure it never happens again. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned journalism. Um, how do you think the media is, is doing right now? We live in a pretty wild media ecosystem. Um, there's not a single voice or even three voices. There's a lot of voices. Can you, what's your, what's your sense of how the media is coping with this, particularly reporting in ways they've never had to report from before that is distant? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, there's been mistakes. I think the media has struggled like they did in the 2016 election uh, to figure out how do you cover these daily press conferences that turn into rallies and, and do it in a way that you get information out, but you don't just give a platform to the president. Uh, there's been, you know, uh, the, the partisan news where, as we talked with Fox, where parts of the media are just delivering very politically motivated rather than scientifically motivated in information. But overall, I think the press has actually been really good. I think most of our information about what this is, what it's going to look like, has come from the press, not, not certainly not the president. Uh, it's the governors and the press that have provided this. They've done a pretty good job getting out information on what people need to do. I mean, I think these doctors who are on, uh, or science scientists and you know all the variants, from hand washing to face masks to staying at home, that's where the information we have is coming from. They have the data now on any television channel at how severe this is. It's a death count. Uh, and I think that's actually important to put out there because we need to know. Mm -hmm. And finally, now we're starting to see the victims of the, uh, of the disease. And uh, you're seeing it with uh, journalists who have it, but you're also starting to see, I, I've noticed in the last few days, more coverage of what's happening in hospitals, uh, what's happening with, with patients. And that's gonna be very important uh, to make sure the public keeps following through and, and doing what's necessary. I've been, I was spoke with a, a journalist earlier in the week about who's trying to do investigative or rural reporting, Lois Parshley, and she wrote this great piece that was in Vox about Alaska and the, the health system and what's going to happen in Alaska. And I was just astounded by um, her creativity and the approach and the approach, particularly as smaller local newspapers have gone away too. The real importance this puts on journalists being creative in their sourcing and having already pre-existing relationships that they're going to have to draw upon now. So to me, um, you know, I know they're they're running around their apartments instead of running around town. Um, mm -hmm. But boy, the amount of work and legwork they're having to do right now is to me really, really humbling. Um, I have one last little question for you before we um, close this segment, and that is really just about how you do your work. You know, it's one thing to um, work about contemporary politics. We, we have a lot of data that's out there, but you're a scholar of the deep American uh, historical experience. And I'm really worried right now about how historians are gonna do their, their work. Our record is mostly not digitized. The archives are closed. What it, how will we continue to tell the story of American history from our, from our apartments and, and houses? It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, I mean, you can't. Uh, since things are not digitized, they are now locked up in facilities for a while. No one's going to be able to reach. There are also physical documents, a lot of uh, historical material until recently. I don't know how that's going to be handled uh, as, as we have new kind of public health guidelines. But uh, I, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm finishing a book now, another book but I'm writing it. So I have all the material. And I was thinking about what you were saying. I was like, if I hadn't gone to the last archive visit a month ago, this is going to be months uh, in the making. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's going to pose some challenges. It's posing challenges also in the world of publishing. Books are getting delayed and, and, and kind of when printing is going to happen is an issue because you need mm -hmm. people uh, still to do that. So I think it's going to be a challenging time for historians. I think there's nothing. It's like the rest of us, you know, it's going to have to go on pause. This is a patience uh, is going to matter if you if you can have patience more than anything else right now. And I don't think there's any other solution unless you somehow have access to digital documents. 
Julian Zelizer from Princeton University and also CNN.com. I hope we get a chance, uh, maybe around the time of our digital conventions, maybe we'll get a chance to chat again. It's a great hour with you discussing and learning and thanks very much. Stay healthy and uh, good luck with your two group projects working now. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. That was a wonderful discussion with Julian Zelizer. And now we're gonna move into the second hour of our special COVID calls today. We're gonna to get a chance to hear from South Korean experts about the pandemic in their country. I'm a frequent visitor, or I used to be, uh, to South Korea. And I was a one-time visiting scholar at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST. I've had the chance to study disasters in South Korea most recently looking at the 2014 Sewol Ferry disaster. So when COVID-19 came, I had a sense of the health and emergency systems that South Korea would rely upon to endure and to fight the pandemic. I'm pleased to report, uh, I was looking at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center before this call that there are um, 10,062 cases, not pleased that they have any cases, but comparatively compared to other countries, Pleased to see that those are the numbers in South Korea with 174 confirmed deaths. We'll turn to our guests to see those numbers may be low. It's but certainly a starkly different picture than Spain or Italy or certainly very different from the United States. So I'm eager today to talk about how South Korea met the pandemic and really what we can learn from their example. So please allow me to introduce uh, my guests for the second hour of COVID calls today. We are joined by Professor Song Sik Bong, MD, PhD. He's Associate Professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Seoul National University Graduate School of Public Health. And I'm also joined by Professor Cheong Jong, Associate Professor and the Head of the Graduate School of Science, Technology and Policy at KAIST. He's a scholar of science, technology, and society, and he's also a friend and research collaborator of mine. I'd like to welcome both Professor Wong and Professor John to COVID calls. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for, thank you for inviting me. Hello, thank you for inviting us today. Good morning. And I'm now going to, that's right, I, I should remind everyone that our two guests here have gotten up at an ungodly early hour to share their information with us this morning. Professor John, I'm now going to um, give you the controls so that um, you can show us slides. The way we're going to proceed in this hour is we have some slides and discussion from Professor Huang and then some time for discussion after that. So let me Please just... give the control to Professor Huang. Ah, yes. Yes. Let me do that. And bear with me one second. As I have not tried to do this before. And I believe now that Professor Huang, you are in control and you can put up slides. Yes. Can, can you see it live? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ten decisive scenes in the COVID-19 epidemic of South Korea, and uh, I am the Ms. Kwang. I'm the professor of the Seoul National University, and I'm the epidemiologist. Yeah. Scene number one, uh, December 17, 2019, South Korea's emergency exercise in December facilitated coronavirus testing containment. Uh, a South Korean tabletop exercise on emergent responses to a fictional mysterious outbreak led directly to tools the country deployed less than a month later to manage the arrival and spread of the coronavirus. Uh, this hypothetical disease quickly spread among the colleagues of the family members and medical workers who treated them. In response, the team of experts at the Korea CDC developed an algorithm to find the pathogen and the cell region, as well as testing techniques. Uh, Sangwon Lee, one of the KCD's experts who lead the grid, said it was blind luck. 
it was a speechless to see the scenario be become reality. And I did what, but the exercise helped us save much time developing testing methodology and identifying cases. Uh, the exercise played a key role in slowing what became Asia's largest coronavirus epidemic outside China using aggressive and sustained testing. Scene number two, January 20th, the first imported case of COVID-19 is detected during a screening at Incheon International Airport. The carrier is a Chinese woman from Wuhan, Hubei Province, China. Dr. Jinyong Kim of the Division of Infectious Disease or Infectious Disease Medicine at Incheon Metropolitan City Medical Center successfully treated the COVID-19 patient one from Wuhan. On Friday, 21st February, uh, she was tested at the public health clinic and was admitted to the medical center. Uh, her oxygen level dropped she reported a severe headache and pain in her flank. Uh, her CT shows pneumonia, which was not visible on uh, chest X-ray. She was provided with oxygen and uh, saturation rose. The headache disappeared, but she still had a fever. And she was being treated in negative pressure isolation room and the handwriting letter to the medic, uh, Dr. Kim, and she used the Google Translator. February 24th, she went back to China and uh, emailed uh, Dr. Kim in, in Korean. Scene number three, uh, January 27th, South Korean health officials convened representatives from over 20 medical companies at the conference room inside Seoul train station. And on January 17th, the WHO World Health Organization announced these testing guidelines. Korean CDC modified this technique testing guideline to better fit in South Korea. Uh, this process made it possible for the Korean government to determine who was infected and transfer Koreans from Wuhan using the charter plane. Up until January 30th, this is confirmed the cases with a pan coronavirus test. This was done by testing whether the patient was positive for coronaviruses and then excluding other known types of coronaviruses. There were a total of six different kinds of known coronavirus, including SARS and MERS. Mm. Testing method became significantly simpler by introducing the real-time reverse transcriptase primary chain reaction, RT-PCR, specifically for COVID-19, which can detect the disease in six hours. Scene number four, February 2nd, the Ministry of Health and Welfare announces foreigners coming from Hubei will be denied entry into Korea. Korea citizen, Korean citizens traveling from Hubei will be granted entry, are required to report their domestic addresses and contact numbers, and self-isolate for 14 days from the date of entry. Travelers from China entering Korea will be directed to a separated arrival hall in Incheon International Airport, they must submit their domestic addresses and contact numbers, which will be verified before entering. The restriction on visa issuances are implemented along with the possibility of suspension for short-term tourist visas. In number five, February 4th, the government announces approval of test kits manufactured by Kogan Biotech Company. Newly developed test kits with capability to produce results in six hours become available at uh, 50 health facilities. Uh, these kits 
well, administered the municipal and provincial government public health institute of health and environment since January 31. It's a kind of real-time PCR kit, a newly developed kit. Scene number six, doomsday in Korean epidemic. February 18th, the media confirms a new COVID-19 patient. This individual, a member of a Sunchanji church in Daegu city, later becomes commonly known as patient 31 and labeled as a a super spreader that result in the massive spike in COVID-19 patient numbers in the days to follow. The foreign policy the issues the article cults and conservative spread the coronavirus in the South Korea, the headline. Scene number seven, February 26th. Goyang City, uh, near the Seoul metropolitan city area, begins operating a drive-through testing station. Uh, this is the first drive-through testing station in Korea operated by the local government. In the late February 27th, South Korea to introduce distribution system for face masks and ban mask exports to distribute face masks swiftly and fairly to all citizens. Uh, the government has decided to fundamentally manage the, the entire process of production, logistics and distribution. The Minister of Economy and Finance and other agencies monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak said in the joint press release, uh, to establish a face fair system, the government to uh, limited weekly sales of face masks sold in local pharmacy to two for every customer. It will be also adopt the odd even rule. Uh, customers born on odd days can purchase masks on odd days and vice versa. In number nine, March 10th, the Minister of Education postponed the start of the new school year for kindergarten and elementary and middle and high schools until March 23rd. The KCD advises all individuals in the South Korea to observe an, observe an enhanced social distancing campaign from March 22 to April 5th by staying home other than going to work, visiting a stay, health stay, healthcare provider and purchasing necessities. This Korean sign said, no entrance, it's cool date. Scene number 10, March 19th, special immigration procedures are extended to include all Koreans and foreigners entering Korea. All inbound travelers are required to submit a questionnaire domestic address and contact information, get their temperature checked and use the self-diagnosis mobile app by reporting daily symptoms for 14 consecutive days after arrival. Individuals who test positive will be transferred to a hospital or right treatment center while Korean citizens and foreigners with a domestic address who are asymptomatic and test negative will be required to self-quarantine at home for 14 days. Foreigners planning for short-term stay without a domestic address will be tested at the facility and individuals who test negative will be granted entry on the enhanced active monitoring. On March 28th, the number of recovered COVID-19 patients in South Korea surpasses the number of patients in quarantine or isolated mm. treatment. They were uh, the, the patient 31, the spike of the, the graph. Uh, through, through timely development and approval of a functioning diagnostic test, 
frequent dissemination of information and public resources heightened border control, border control and meticulous contact mapping through patient questionnaires and GPS-based mobile application. South Korea's effort to flatten the curve are similar working. Second way, we need to be alert. Scientists fear second coronavirus wave as China's lockdown is. Uh, the virus would have difficulty re-establishing itself in the community if a significant portion of people between 50% uh, and 70% were infected and are now immune. But note that uh, even in Wuhan, the number of those people infected and are now immune to the disease is probably less than 10% which means there are a lot of, uh, lots of people still vulnerable to infection. Mm -hmm. uh, a vaccine would increase the percentage of immune people, but no vaccine are expected for uh, at least uh, one or two years. That's the end. Finish it. Okay, thank you very much. If you can, um... Professor Wong, if you can uh, restore the myself as the host, okay. then that will allow us to all um, be on the screen together. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So um, I want to remind everyone that uh, Professor Song Sik Wong is our guest, as well as Professor Cheong Jong. And we're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic in South Korea. And that was really, really um, great grounding in uh, the timeline there in South Korea. I'm going to ask some follow-up questions, uh, maybe reiterate some of the points that you just made and also give an opportunity for people to get questions in. So please do send your questions. Um, you can use the chat function on YouTube Live. You can also email questions to me at sgk23 at drexel.edu. And you can also get questions in via Twitter just tag me at US of disaster. So I just wanna go back actually to the beginning of your presentation. And this is a question for, for both of you. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, infectious disease surveillance system in South Korea? How much do you rely on the World Health Organization? But, and, and I'm asking that question because then we wanna talk about how much South Koreans trust the health messages that were coming out and if there was any backlash to that. So can you talk to us a little bit about how communication worked and also about how surveillance works in South Korea? Uh, uh, actually, uh, South Korean infectious disease surveillance system is quite so well and uh, we we have it, uh, experienced the MERS case in 2015. Um, uh, however, uh, Chinese government uh, they uh, hidden the cases in Wuhan Wuhan cases. So the WHO uh, they they don't they don't the, the information from China Chinese government. So. Uh, this uh, this COVID nineteen cases the uh, broken broken cases in the uh, cooperation between uh, WHO and regional government, China government and Chinese government and Korean government. Mm. So the linkage there between the Chinese government and the WHO and the South yeah. Korean yeah. linkage was poor. It was not a good yeah. not a good not, linkage. Not, not good linkage. Uh, I see. Cases. So. In South Korea then, um, and you were talking to us about the communication, do citizens generally trust the public health messaging that came from the South Korean government? Okay, uh, um, most of citizens uh, uh, trusted the government messaging, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I expect the bipartisan uh, media, media by bipartisan eyes, and then uh, right, right wing part media, uh, the the uh, the new senator criticized the government plan mm. and government uh, 
COVID-19 plan and treatment act, some, some kind of uh, message, the, the readily the, 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 the message, the South Korean government message. Mm -hmm. Professor John, I mean, can you offer yes. some perspective yeah. on that? Because you know, one of the things that was said here in the United States, it wasn't consensus, but one of the things people said was, oh, well, you know, in South Korea, everyone will just do whatever the government says. And my reaction to that was, no, this is a functioning democracy with a free press and plenty of disagreement. But you know, we didn't get good coverage in the United States of what was going on in South Korea. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Uh as Professor Huang said, there is a, a divide, divided media landscape uh, in South Korea, as, as in any other uh, democracy. So the, a lot of media coverage has been uh, uh, focusing on whether the government is doing it right or wrong. So there is a, uh, a praise and then uh, appreciation, but also there is a severe criticism all throughout the process. And so in, but but in, this, in this divided media scape, uh, I think the this has become a good test case for uh, disaster communication by the government mm. to the citizens. So uh, I, th I think a lot of citizens are now paying attention to what the government says officially. And the, the Korean CDC, uh, and, the, and, uh, and they are, they're holding uh, the daily uh, press briefings and press uh, conferences at 2 p.m. every day. So the, either the director or the, uh, uh, the vice uh, or deputy director level, uh, someone in charge comes out uh, in, in live TV every day at 2 p.m. and they report daily uh, new cases and treatments and, and any other major developments. And then they take questions from the media and then they answer them with uh, a fairly uh, good um, confidence. And then they, they have become, uh, in my view, they have become a reliable source, direct source of uh, information for many citizens. So, um, and, uh, and it's that the CDC director has now become a kind of a, a national hero or a kind of household mm -hmm. name for all Koreans because everyone uh, sees her um, in, in everyday uh, live press conference. And so I think it has becoming a really good um, example of uh, disaster communication, the official disaster communication. And I think it will be studied uh, pretty uh, seriously after all this. Professor John, let me stay with you for just a second, if I could, on this. Um, has President Moon's, um, has the public's opinion of President Moon, has it been shifting throughout this crisis? You know, it's impossible for Americans to think about COVID-19 and not talk about Donald Trump because he's inserted himself right into the center of the story. Was that similar in, in the South Korean case? Uh, Yes, I mean he's he's very he's very active in, in, in managing responding to all the crises. Although uh, he's he hasn't been on live TV very much. I mean, he's, mm. he's done it, but he hasn't been uh, uh, on on live TV every day. Uh, but he's, uh, instead, of, but he but he sent out messages through his uh, staff meetings, and, and it has been reported. But uh, but, uh, but his uh, approval rating has has increased. Now mm. it's I think the, the 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 most recent number that I saw was 56 percent approval rating uh, i mean you know so that's uh and and it has been uh rising uh over the course of the corona uh pandemic it's an so interesting thing to note yes yeah yeah professor huang let me come back to you and we can talk a little bit more about the ed epidemiological response could you talk to us a little bit about how contact tracing was used in south korea And contact tracing uh, and uh, the tra traveler, uh, traveler in, uh, in Korean Korean citizen to uh, the, in, the, in the airport, uh, the, the set up the smartphone smartphone app, yeah. and the info, information input the address and uh, information on the symptom. And the Korean government and uh, the health public has uh, public has the uh, public station to the uh, the, the inform the smartphone message and the daily check up the uh, check up the uh, symptom and and the location information. 
Professor Huang, if I could stay with you, you know, one of the things that in the United States you may have been following, we've had terrible problems um, getting the tests, yeah. having an adequate number of tests um, to the point at which in, in some places they've basically gone to saying, if you have the symptoms, assume that you have COVID-19 and seek treatment, don't even wait for a test. Could you talk to us a little bit about the South Korean approach to COVID-19 testing? Why was the testing so effective, rolled out so quickly? Yeah, uh, uh, government, uh, government adapted mass testing for early detection and the government met with the test procedures and agreed on the need to produce the kit rapidly. Yeah. Test kit were made available in early February thanks to fast track approval in Korean FDA. In about six weeks, more than uh, 300,000 people were tested and early action by the government and mass testing has led to early detection and self-isolation to prevent infection. Mm. I think also the one thing that I want to mention is that when the patient 31 was confirmed in uh, on uh, February 18th and then later on, and then the number of new cases kind of spiked in, in the city of Daegu and, and in the neighboring uh, uh, area. And th the, because of the, the infections among the, uh, the church members and the government requested the, the list of um, all the members of the church, which was about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Huang, but I think about 200,000. And then, and then it was uh, spreading very fast. And then the, the government tr uh, uh, tried to track down every one of them with their contact information and then, uh, and then doing the test. Uh, so it, it was a very intense period of testing in the city of Daegu for uh, after the patient theory number one. How many people live in Daegu? About 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. And the 200,000 members of this church Oh, that's that's nationwide. Yeah. It's a nationwide church, yeah. Okay. And um, did that cause some uh, stress, or was there some pushback about this very uh, vigorous contract tracing and testing regime? Either Professor Huang or Professor John care to comment how the public perceived um, the testing. I, I think so. Um, most of the people that uh, adopted uh, uh, te uh, widespread testing and uh, quick test nationwide for quick testing. Mm. Yes, I think the uh, a lot of people um, very soon um, realized the need for quick and mass uh, uh, testing, uh, and then. Uh, the very uh, detailed track down of the, all these contacts and then uh, whereabouts of the, of the patients. So we are now getting used to receiving uh, uh, disaster messages on our um, phones every day by, uh, sent by the local uh, authorities uh, when there is a new case in, in, the, in, in our city, in each city. And for a while it gave a uh, and then we could we, we were notified of all the whereabouts of the patients prior to that date. So they mm -hmm. the some uh, in in earlier phase even the names of the shops um, and restaurants were released for the public so that, that they could uh, kind of avoid them uh, uh, for a while. I was um, wondering too. Maybe we should clarify that the emphasis here was on testing that could confirm COVID-19 cases. Has there also been um, so-called antibody tests to confirm whether or not people had it, uh, even if they were exposed and didn't present symptoms?
Well, I think I, I have to leave it to Professor Huang about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't have, please, please stay. Uh, oh, that's fine, we'll, we can return to that. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question yeah. uh, more generally about the role of the access to healthcare in South Korea. Yeah. Um, what is healthcare like in South Korea? Is it yeah. decentralized and privatized? Is it universal healthcare? Yeah. Take us inside how, how that works in South yeah. Korea. South Korea system is universal health coverage and health financing. Yeah. All patients have access to treatment covered by the Korea National Health Insurance Service, NHI, uh, for communicable diseases such as COVID-19, co-payment of NHI is exempt. Uh, and the financial burden of treatment is minimized for patients. Yeah. All, all the more than all the more than ninety percent of hospitals are private. Uh, they all participate in the NHI system with the same contract condition for the both public and private providers set by law. Yeah. When when masks are rationed, they are distributed distributed by pharmacies using the NHI database. The COVID nineteen experience highlights how. Universal healthcare is an, is an important foundation to cooperate uh, epidemic and health security crisis. Professor John, is there, uh, do you have a sense of the uh, public perception of the universal healthcare system coming into this pandemic? Has it been a source of uh, disagreement in South Korea the way it has in the United States? I and mean, when we argue about healthcare, like we argue, we argue about healthcare constantly in the United States. Has that also been true in South Korea? Uh, uh, no, I think now it's uh, that universal healthcare uh, is taken for granted in, in South Korea. The, uh, it's, uh, I think, a, Almost all Koreans take it as take it as a just given system, and then mm -hmm. and, and then uh, as Professor Hwang said, it's that system uh, is is functioning in in this uh, crisis by giving uh, uh, access to testing and then and then treatment. Did you find in this pandemic that there was overwhelming stress on the system? Were there long lines for tests? Were there stress in the hospitals um, serving patients at the worst of the surge? Because we're seeing that in the United States. This is taxing our health system in a way we've never really seen before. Professor Wang has better information uh, than this uh, in this uh, than, than myself. But then, uh, in in the city of Tegu, when where. where where the uh, patient 31 appeared and then spread very quickly. And then at that time, uh, there was a, a, a backlog of testing and also hospital beds. So uh, the confirmed uh, patients had, sometimes they had to wait in order to be admitted to hospitals in the city of Teco. So that was a kind of stressful moment uh, uh, within the city. Uh, but as time goes on, that stress, uh, that, that pressure, uh, has been relieved uh, by uh, uh, by um, getting more hospital beds, also transferring them, uh, and then also making decisions to transfer um, the light symptom uh, patients to uh, other uh, life care centers that were quickly created uh, uh, out of um, the, the corporate and government facilities. Um, so I think that has be, there has been much effort to relieve the pressure on the medical system uh, in the city of Tegu. Mm. Professor Wong, has it been a very stressful time for yeah. doctors and health workers in South Korea? Yeah, yeah. Two, about uh, two, during the two, epidemic for two months, the health professionals are so tired and exhausted. And yesterday, the, one of the doctor, uh, infected doctor, died mm. in Daegu, Daegu City. So many, so many South Koreans, South Korean health professionals are mourned to this death. 
Professor Wong, I wonder if recent pandemics yeah. played a role in South Korea's ability seemingly to very well meet yeah. Yeah. this pandemic. I'm thinking of SARS, uh, yeah. bird flu, H1N1. Yeah. Had those played an important role in uh, allowing South Korean health officials to be ready for this pandemic? Uh, it's kind of learning from the past experience, uh, the painful experience of the nurse uh, with 186 cases and 38 deaths in 2015 has led to lessons learned in the quicker response from both the government and the public. The current administ administration invested more funds in the health sector compared to prior administration. As the first early cases of COVID-19 were reported, the government was already on a fast track to prepare mass production and tested and the key step for early detection and quick containment of the viruses. The public also were prepared to accept the extensive contact tracing for effective detection at the expense of privacy. As a result, the government and the public worked together in containing the disease as quickly as possible to prevent a, a repeat of the March crisis. Mm. Professor John, um, that was really interesting what Professor Wong just said that, that maybe there'd been more resources um, put towards this kind of pandemic preparedness in Professor Moon's administration than in Professor Park's administration. Does that, does, is, is that normal in South Korea that different administrations would fund very differently the kind of health research necessary to be prepared for a pandemic? Uh, yes, I think so. The uh, you know, different, I mean, as in, as in the US, different administrations have different values and different priorities. And then, um, so I think that that makes difference. And as Professor Huang said, I think it's, uh, this is very also interesting and useful case of how to learn from the past. Mm. Uh, and then after the 2015 MERS outbreak, and then at the time, the, the Korean government uh, was highly criticized of its handling uh, the, the, the disaster and about its information uh, distribution systems and et cetera. And so after that, after that, the, uh, the medical uh, professionals and also government authorities, uh, I believe that they studied the case a lot and they, did, they released a white paper. And then uh, they really, it's, I mean, it now turns out that they really uh, worked hard to learn from uh, the past. And mm -hmm. I think it, it's working uh, out uh, for this time. Uh, and, and many, many, uh, some, some of the uh, government officials at, at, at the center of this management, the uh, um, COVID-19 management are also people who worked during the MERS outbreak in 2015. So they are really practicing what they learned uh, in 2015. So this, the MERS is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And yes. uh, as Professor Huang said, there were, there were 38 deaths in yeah, South Korea yeah. from that. Um, and so that came just one year also after the Sewol Ferry disaster, right? So it's, a, it's a interesting to me, sort of the convergence of these disasters seems to maybe have led to a, um, I don't know, a greater emphasis on capacity of forensics and learning from disaster in South Korean government. That's just a hypothesis. What do you think of that? Professor Huang or Professor John, either one. Um, I mean, I, I, I hope so. The, as as you also know that in 2014 and, and then 2015 going through the cell welfare disaster and then MERS uh, and during those two consecutive years there was a lot of question uh, and the criticism about the role of the state in in protecting the citizens lives basically and then these two uh, cases among other things really um, question the legitimacy of the state for a lot of uh, citizens in Korea. And that, well, I think that, that, that questioning and then criticism and then in response to that, and then the reconfirmation of the role of the state in, 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 the case, uh, in, in times of crisis. I think that, um, uh, I think we see 
we're seeing we seeing the changes coming from those reflections and responses to those earlier disasters. Mm -hmm. Professor Huang, I wonder if I can ask you what you expect to happen next. Is life returning to normal in South Korea? Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, about one or two months if the COVID-19 epidemic is prolonged. So uh, we, we had a, a kind of new, new normal and, and the social, social, social distancing and, and social and physical distancing is the, the average life, lifestyle in, in South Korea. Mm. This is part of a new lifestyle in South Korea. Lifestyle, yes. I want to ask you a little more about this, if I can, because one of the things, you know, uh, I think I read today, 75% of people in the United States are now basically sheltering in place at home. Mm -hmm. So we were, we are now where you were uh, in February. Mm -hmm. And we don't know yet what kind of um, signals we should be looking for to return to normal. You're talking about a couple of months of maybe returning to normal in South Korea. People will be seeking reassurance that it's okay to come out again. Have you seen something similar in South Korea? Citizens very eager to have a sort of continued reassurance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. very difficult, uh, very difficult decision and when, when we will Come, come back to normal life. The, the government and health, health authorities, uh, uh, first they do, we reopen the school, mm -hmm. school, elementary and middle and high school. Uh, maybe, maybe not in university, uh, university in, uh, in full, full semester uh, and, uh, and done. Uh, that's, that's not new. Uh, uh, South Korean government health, health authorities uh, uh, will uh, have, a have a decision to uh, open the school and back to the work. And uh, my, my condition of social distancing and we will start to the uh, normal life, maybe the election date, uh, election date in uh, April 15th. Mm -hmm. after, after the election date, the, the government can uh, uh, the uh, government decide the, the, the uh, normal, normalized uh, lifestyle in, uh, in mm -hmm. In South Korea. So, Professor John, the, uh, you have an election coming up April 15. Just like in the United States, this pandemic in a democracy has to take place alongside, uh, you know, the, the disease process and the, and the coping and the strategies take place alongside electoral politics. Um, what's the context of this election? I'm assuming the COVID 19 has been a major topic of discussion. It's like a midterm election there, right? Uh this is a, a nationwide election for the Congress. So yeah. we, we do it every four years and then mm -hmm. uh, all the seats are uh, changing at this time. So, um, mm -hmm. so uh, yes, the COVID-19 has become, I think the, the biggest issue uh, this time. I mean, there, there have been many other issues in, in the elections, but then uh, I think that currently the COVID-19 is the biggest uh, thing on every citizen's mind. So they'll be evaluating the government responses uh, and the ruling party's uh, handling of the, the situation. And then also the, and the opposition party will, uh, is, is trying to uh, criticize uh, what the government uh, has been doing uh, in this crisis. So I think the, uh, the election will be a, a kind of evaluation uh, moment uh, for this in, in two weeks. And the one, one interesting thing about the election in the time of disaster is that, is that the, uh, this time, uh, many of the, the embassies and consulates abroad, uh, the Korean embassies and consulates are, they are not 
they cannot function, not all of them can function properly. So uh, they now about, the news says that about half of uh, those who are abroad, the Koreans abroad and eligible to vote, half of them cannot vote this time because of the non-functioning uh, election uh, system, uh, the, the business uh, there. Um, so it, it really limits uh, the, the voting rights for many Koreans. And then as Professor Huang said, the, the April 15 is only two weeks away. And then, uh, you know, election is itself is mass gathering. So right. it's, it's the, the very act of voting becomes, uh, you know, get, becomes the, the risk of uh, getting contacts with, uh, with a lot of people. And so how to handle this, this uh, the essential democratic mass gathering in a time of social distancing? I think it's, it's, it's a difficult um, political uh, task, but also kind of logistical uh, task as well. Well, the debate around that in the United States has been that states need to make um, available the capacity to do mail-in voting so that people don't actually have to go and wait in a line. Lines are already long in the United States. And if you space people six feet apart, these lines are going to stretch for miles. Do you have mail-in voting in South Korea? Um, but, but you have to uh, uh, sort of register for that. So yeah, it's for too fast. Citizens, right. So uh, for most citizens, it's, uh, you have to actually go to the, the voting stations. Uh, but we have a pre-voting pre period uh, for two days. So the election date is uh, April 15th, but I think that April uh, uh, 10 and 11 is a pre-voting day. So you can, you can go and so you can, you can, you can distribute a little bit but not, uh, mm. no. Professor Huang, may I ask you, um, what is your message to your peers in the United States, to doctors and epidemiologists in the United States? What should they learn from South Korea right now? I think the United States uh, the Korean the contact tracing and uh, all the mass testing and factor of rapid response to the public health, public health. The, uh, the more and more uh, all the mass testing is, will, be, will be effective to the flattening the epidemic curve. I think so. And the health, health, uh, health, uh, health professionals have a very big burden to the COVID-19 patients, uh, frightening increase in patients. The, the mental, mental health and physical health, the, the, the main, the, uh, main, uh, main, main barrier of the do not the uh, broken system, healthcare system, the healthcare, healthcare officials, healthcare professionals have uh, play, played a major role to uh, do not break, break, break the uh, healthcare system in the United States. Mm -hmm. Professor Huang, if I could ask you in your own training, yes. um, did you ever have an opportunity to do uh, a test exercise or a practice yes. of any kind for this pandemic? Uh, not uh, uh, in 2009, 2009 uh, in uh, in the flu, uh, flu, flu epidemic, uh, H1, H1N1 flu, influenza epidemic. Uh, I was um, a member of the epidemiologist in, in public health epidemiologist. And 2015, 2015 uh, in most epidemic, uh, I was the field epidemiologist. I played the role of the field epidemiologist and to the uh, questioning and surveying and 
watching the Fish TV and check the credit card UCD. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's very, very, very interesting uh, experience for me. Mm. Do you expect that a vaccine will be introduced in South Korea relatively soon? How long do you think it will take? I don't. Uh, I I have a, a quite pessimistic uh, opinion to, to develop the vaccine. Uh, the bi biologics can uh, infectious disease uh, medicine. They, they, they think or they uh, anticipate uh, as possible as uh, one or two years. Mm -hmm. One or two years. So two years. The, the second wave of epidemic is in the winter season of 2020. Uh, the, the second wave will be. Uh, might be uh, the, the second in 2020 mm. winter, winter season. Yeah. We, 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 we do not, we do not uh, pass the second wave back then. Professor John, I was asking Professor Huang about his own uh, maybe special training and preparedness uh, to you know, endure this particular moment. I wonder in your case, you know, you're the head of a science technology and policy analysis unit at KAIST. Um, what kind of training do you have to make sense of this, of this moment? And I, and I guess if you'd share with us, how do you think COVID-19 is gonna change the way science and technology research works in South Korea? Um. Yes, that's a good, that, that's a good question. I think the um, South Korea has been uh, and, 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 and still focuses on um, innovative uh, technology in information technology and in biotech, etc. And it's been doing quite well in, in that area. And the 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 recent the COVID nineteen testing kit uh, uh, test kits and then and related innovations also played a very important role in responding to the disaster. But at the same time, I also see that uh, smaller innovations, I mean, not so disruptive innovations, but smaller innovations uh, in really uh, getting to the citizens and then, uh, and, and then doing the test and then also uh, the sensing and the monitoring, et cetera. So all these uh, uh, small innovations that some, some small creativities uh, on the go were also very important in really managing this real time disaster. Um, so I think the uh, also maybe it's I mean we, we will keep doing the innovative uh, work uh, in, in the large scale, but also uh, this paying attention to the uh, the daily routinized uh, small innovations. Um, I think that those are also very um, uh, important. And and then the question of how to uh, live with what we have, or also how to work with what we have, and then doing the best uh, 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 of what we can uh, with available resources in a very limited uh, uh, conditions. I think that has become also important uh, uh, task and then that, that can have some uh, impact on the way we think about the role of science in, in society and in politics. And then also uh, the question of making uh, decisions on the go, uh, mm. making uh, wise decisions on the go and, and, and also collectively and, and then with kind of um, discussion and the consensus. And that, has, that is also a very important issue in this emergent, emergency situations. And then that, the, the decisions are uh, simultaneously scientific and political. And, mm -hmm. and Professor Fang has recently gave an excellent interview about this, uh, this inseparability, or uh, I mean, the, this way we think about this uh, connection or the relationship between science and politics in responding to the, uh, the, the crisis. So I think it's a good uh, case to uh, think about the how, the how to connect science and politics in a very wise way in making collective decisions. Because hmm. just to bring back a little of the context, I mean, the Sewol Ferry 
disaster, the MERS incident you were talking about. I know there's a major investigation going on right now about um, illness caused by uh, humidifier disinfectants. I mean, problems about the government in South Korea and, and how well it was managing public safety, those have been in the forefront of South Korean politics for several years now. Are you surprised that the government has performed so well in the midst of the COVID-19? Or is it more that those lessons were learned very quickly and their response now was robust as a result of that learning? Um. Yes, as you said, the those investigations are still going on about the cell phone disaster and then humidifier disinfectant cases, uh, which were very crucial in, in the Koreans' perception of public safety. And uh, I don't think we, we have learned enough lessons from those uh, cases mm -hmm. yet, and then things are still uh, debated, and then also uh, investigations are still uh, underway and then uh, and with 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 quite a bit of difficulty um, so we haven't it's not I don't think there is a, a direct connections from those two these uh, the current COVID-19 um, uh, maybe it's it's more about learning from MERS in this uh, specific case but I think in general uh, by going through all these uh, different uh, sorts of disasters in the recent five, six years, uh, in, uh, in general, there, there is increasing um, sensitivity to the issue of safety uh, and, and health, and then also the, the government role in all of this, and then uh, and most of the importance of learning from the past experiences. Professor Huang, um, my previous guest, Julian Zelizer, was saying he expected more young people in the United States now to go to public health school and to go to medical school. Do you expect a similar thing to happen in South Korea? Will there be even more young people now who'll be turning to health professions? Uh, in, in, med in South Korea, medical school is quite a very narrow uh, gate. The high and smart and young and smart students uh, uh, hope to, to enter the medical, medical school. Uh, so I hope uh, more and more medical students to have a, uh, have a job to the public health and epidemiology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Um, Professor John, one more question for you. Um, you have a very unique vantage point here because you've lived and studied in the United States. Um, and you know, you know both cultures very well. I wonder, you know, given that vantage point, do you have any advice or any lessons for Americans, you know, things we should be learning from the South Korean experience that you think Americans can, can take up? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure this is uh, exactly learning from South Korea, but I think it, I mean, I, I'm also realizing that uh, how important it is uh, to have uh, trust in public institutions in times of crisis uh, and the government and also related health authorities here. And the, the South Koreans have very high expectation of the government functions and, and the role of government in, 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 in all those essential um, areas. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, we have, maybe we haven't had that much confidence and trust in, in in, in the recent government's handling of the uh, uh, different uh, crisis. Uh, but I think in, in times like this, whether in the US or in Korea, it's re really important to create that kind of uh, trust relationship between the citizens and government uh, so that they can listen to the, the official messages. They can, uh, they can really uh, take them seriously and then put them into action in their lives. And all these uh, trust-based um, communication and then actions are very important in handling all of these crises. Professor Chiang John of KAIST and Professor Sung Sik Wong of Seoul National University, thank you so much for getting up very early for you on a Saturday morning and sharing the narrative of what happened in South Korea and lessons that we can take in the United States and in other countries as well. 
um, from those lessons and, and good luck in your work going forward. I know it's not over there. Um, so thank you again for sharing that wisdom with us. I'd like to remind everybody that the COVID calls take place every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. We have a full week next week of guests. Every call next week will be at 5 p.m. Uh, on Monday, we have a researchers roundtable with young disaster researchers uh, who will be sharing their own insights into COVID-19 and how they think that the pandemic is gonna shape their own research going forward. I wish everyone uh, a healthy and restful weekend, and we will see you and speak with you right here again on Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Professor John, Professor Hong, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Hong Jin Sun님 아직 포스트로 되어 계시네요. 그런가요? 네. 네. 아 이거 끄 끄다야겠네요. 끊을게요 저도. 네.